Uh, in the first place, I want to say, no, in the zero place. <laughs> uh, do you like index-only scans? Yes, I expected this answer. <laughs> uh, you will see why I asked this question. <laughs> So in the first place, I want to say that SQL is a huge, unbelievable success. It is the most successful non-imperative language ever existed. And I dare say, it is the only non-imperative language which has been accepted by ignorant majority, lot and taught by them, whose only way of thinking is pretty damn straight imperative. No. But SQL is more than a language. It is not only bright and thoroughly elaborated idea, it is also decades of production experience, an established corpus of algorithms, and a great deal of already debugged software. So let's start criticizing it. Uh, there is a fad in nowadays computer pseudoscience called no SQL, which stands for no idea, no experience, no algorithms, and no software. <laughs> I, I think that it is an utterly bad idea to abolish all these achievements, but bad ideas not necessarily come from bad reasoning. And even if this reason is not well reflected by no SQL supporters themselves, if we reflect on this reason, we will find a proper answer to no SQL fed. Through the years of practicing SQL, I have built up uh, some disappointment which become formalized in this speech so there are certain flows in SQL, imperative DDL instead of declarative, I've told you about this two years ago, uh, lack of the notion of state transition, it's a very important point because not every database is a dead, dusty, immutable archive. Uh, usually in business applications, data are constantly changing and it is changing non-randomly. All these changes follow the pretty formal business rules. Uh, and we have very few means to express these rules. Only a procedural language which is unspecific and again it is imperative. Lack of loosely structured data representation is a trump card of SQL haters, you know. Lack of hierarchical data output is also used in, in the argument against SQL. And I, I stress output particularly because the hierarchical data itself is fine. <laughs> but output is the issue. Very bad flaw is inconsistency and needless complexity based mostly on the faulty attempt of natural language mimicking, which attempt appeared so faulty that only few of us even remember that this attempt has been made. But we all, we all are still carrying the burden of its legacy, the monstrous select syntax, which also mixing up all selection operations with output formatting operations all together in one statement. Also, I'm very concerned as reading SQL standards, later ones, about XML contamination of SQL. I consider it a serious a significant sign of decay. But today we, we, are, we concentrate on the two most important flaws of SQL, the foreign keys 
and tables. These two, they pave the ground for the ultimate flaw of SQL. Major flaw. Impossibility of relations between relations. Think about it. Let there be a pretty simple, trivial, typical piece of data, category and item. We are all familiar with ER entity relation diagrams, and they are indeed very profound way of visualizing your database design. And I liked it until I asked myself, why do we refer to item and category as entities? Well, I know the underlying theory as they correspond to nouns, uh, they characterized by their attributes and what else? Uh, they represent a certain aspect of domain knowledge. But how will we map them into tables? Uh, we will map them into a database as tables, but tables are supposed to represent relations. So we actually have three relations here, a relation item, a relation category, and a relation between them. Why do we represent two of these relations properly as it's supposed to be represented by means of tables? And at the same time, we simulate the third one by low-level programming of foreign key. And I am pretty serious about this level of the programming thing. Look. There is a difference between abstraction level of foreign key and a table. We simply declare category is, an, is a relation. And we do not care how the machine will associate it, its attributes. For us, these attributes in every tuple are simply associated no matter how. At the same time, if we are uh, practicing foreign keys, we involved in very internals of the representation of a relation. We actually take care about foreign key type. We take care about foreign key values. We actually do maintain the very association between attributes of these relations, of this relation, a relation between category and item. We created much like manually. We associate every pair of attribute in every tuple. So the system helps us by checking referential integrity, but it still does not see a foreign key as a relation at all. You, you cannot apply any relational operation to this relation represented with foreign key. From the perspective of the system, this representation of a relation is external. And I sense a very profound no SQL reason here, no motivation, no, no SQL supporters, they, they don't have reason, they have motivations. And I sense this motivation. If a system provides me some means to represent an object, namely relations and tables, why do I bother with my own representation of the lower level 
And if I do, if I maintain my own representation for the same object, why do I bother with SQL in the first place? Okay, let's pretend everything is fine by now. Uh, can you define a difference uh, which relation must be represented which way? We have two ways for representing relations here. Can you define difference which represents which uh, relations to represent which way? You can. You really can. A relation between relations shall be represented somehow differently. So we have foreign keys for representing relations between relations. But foreign key is only capable of representing a binary relation one to many. For any more complex relations, we have to employ link tables, which is another representation for relations. Some databases introduce inheritance and subclasses. Uh, do I need to stress that a subclass is a relation on a class? And most importantly, some databases introduce complex types, arrays, collections, which are also a representation for relations. And if you doubt about this one, let's take a look at Oracle documentation. A collection is defined as, read this source code, do you see any difference to a table? Uh, it what's is the, not a difference to a table. What's, what's the primary key of this? Mm, mm, probably there is no primary key, but there is also no a difference from a table. It is a relation, no more and no less. And yet it is considered different. But why? Why so many representations for the same object? I know why. Because we decided to represent relations between relations differently. But relations between relations are the majority in any domain knowledge. We actually have discriminated the majority of all relations because any domain knowledge is not a plain set of relations it is a whole hierarchy of relations and most of these relations treat other relations as domains almost every relation in any domain knowledge is a relation between other relations and we have discriminated them. Because the ugly notion of tables is not capable of representing relations between relations. It cannot adopt another table as a relation domain. So that notion of table actually forces us to split this hierarchy into layers and to choose exactly one layer out of this hierarchy to be represented by means of tables. And then we have to employ foreign keys and link tables for any relation above the chosen one, uh, above the chosen layer. And also we have collections, arrays, field constraints for representing relations below the chosen layer. It looks like we afraid of relations between relations and nurturing our intellectual fear with stack piles of different representations avoiding the holy grail of any formal model self-similarity 
so much effort to avoid self-similarity of representation. While it was so close, really close. Subclasses, collections, they are exotic disturbances to the relational model. But link tables, they are very mainstream and also they seem to be the final solution because they're capable of representing almost everything. So let's take a closer look at link tables. Here is a trivial, typical, let's say typical, many-to-many -many relation called book genre between book and genre. This relation is represented by link table book genre with two foreign keys. And I'm pretty sure that this picture is very familiar to you very familiar so it appears not very easy to figure out what's wrong with it so let us count how many relations is depicted here a relation book one a relation book genre two and a relation genre three and two extra meaningless relations represented with foreign keys which are even hard to give names to. So we have two extra meaningless relations. We have five relations on this picture. Well, you, you can, from this point, um, object. A foreign key not necessarily represent a relation. And I totally agree. Sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. So you will have two completely indistinguishable objects, namely foreign keys, with pretty opposite semantic. This foreign key, for some reason outside of the database, does not represent any relation itself. But this one do, does. Congratulations! It is only a preamble to your problems. The real problem is much worse. Let's select something from the relation book genre. Namely, let us select all genres of given author. We select genre name from all three tables properly joined by uh, according to foreign keys provided. And there is still nothing unusual. But look, all information uh, we want to retrieve is localized in a relation book genre. And relation book genre is a relation on Cartesian product of relations genre and book. In other words, we have to perform a search of the dimension book genre. This search we have to perform. And what do we do instead? We create a Cartesian product of book, genre, and book genre itself. And then we perform the search of this dimension, which is twice bigger than needed. So in typical and commonly recommended case, we perform search of a dimension twice bigger than needed. Isn't it ridiculous? And I mentioned these horrors to apprise you 
that the following proposal is not only syntax improvement, is not only stylistic improvement to SQL syntax. There are two definitions of relations in math. They are pretty simple and famous and very known. According to both of them, relation is a set. Well, the this, this second, this second definition is more important for us in the context of this speech because it gives us a notion of relation graph and relation domains. So, according to these definitions, a relation is a set. A relation domains, a relation domain is a set. Therefore, a relation can be a domain of another relation. In real life, in relational algebra, in math, a relation can be a domain of another relation, but not in SQL. Uh, we are not talking about subqueries yet. But I, I clearly show you that there is no possibility to represent a relation between relation by means of tables. Because table cannot adopt another table as a domain. Table can only adopt basic types as domains. And this ugly notion of table, which is supposed to represent relations, has effectively replaced the very idea of relation. We cannot think about relations as relations anymore. We think about them as tables. But tables aren't relations. They are uglier and they don't have crucial capability of adopting another relation as domain. You may, you may find lots of apology for this fact, but the fact will remain. SQL does not reflect the very basic property of relational algebra. Because of this, I want to propose another approach to the query language, which will embrace this simple, basic property of relational algebra. The language, the query language, which will embrace the idea of relations between relations, and this language I'm going to propose right now. We only have to make a closure. It is hard to pronounce, so just read the definition. The most important part of this definition is this line highlighted. And everything is plain and clear except for the graph, relation graph, which is yet to be defined. And let us define it. Let there be a relation rho. By the way, uh, is this slide clearly visible? Can you read? Uh, can you read from my slides? Uh, okay, I, I'm just worried. <laughs> uh, let there be a relation rho between domains A and B. This is the graph of this relation. Assuming that we already have domains A and B somehow represented, we only have to represent the legs of this graph. So we may say that relation graph is a set. And we can represent it as a set of integers. Easy to see that any finite set can be represented as a set of integers. So we always have a set with a linear order. 
Let's build an index on it. It is an index on raw, on relational graph raw. It is an index, and, it is, and at the same time, it is a graph of the relation raw. So, what, what question a relation graph is supposed to answer? The relation graph is supposed to answer the, uh, the, the question whether a particular tuple belongs to the relation or not. The very same question an index is supposed to answer. Not only this question, but also these questions. So, they share the purpose and they can have the same representation. So that from our perspective, a relation graph and an index are equal. A relation graph is an index. Strictly speaking, an index uh, is a very special relation. It is a relation with linear order, but it is still a relation. And it still contains all information we needed. Now tell me, did we impose any restrictions on the domains A and B? Did we assume that a and B are of basic type. We did not. We did not, a, we did not impose any restrictions on these domains A and B. That means we just created a relation between relations. So you need uh, integers for A and B? Uh, um, okay. I, like I'm just using integers to represent a set, and I, I can. It is a valid representation of a set. I can represent any finite set with a set of integers. Why do well, I do it because I can. <laughs> so we, we actually did not impose any restrictions on the domains A and B, so that these domains can be anything. These A and B can be any relations. So we have just created a relation between relations. And it is not a little bit scary, it's just an index. We have created a missing essential element of SQL, which has been missing for decades, and it is not even mind-blowing. The only novelty is that attributes, attributes of this index belong to different tables. It is very significant novelty, but it does not create any wrong about the index itself. This index still can be uh, maintained by contemporary software with very few improvements. So, multi-table indexes will save the day. With very few improvements. But also, these multi-table indexes, they put the joins out of the job. Tell me, what joins do? Exactly! A join creates a relation. A join takes two existing relations and produces a brand new one. And it is very essential, very sensitive operation. It really makes sense, except for the fact 
that the result in relation already exists. A result in relation of a join does already exist. Let's select something from our first example. Uh, category item. This relation shown in, shown in white, so uh, this join will create this relation shown in white. You see? But this relation is already here, but it is hidden behind the foreign key shown in yellow. So that this join does only convert information into another representation. And it is you who created this relation by feeding the database with the information which is now stored in the yellow, show, in, in the yellow foreign key. But this join converts this information from one representation into another each time you are accessing this information each time and you don't need this labor and not only your computer is carrying this burden but also you are because you have to codify this trivial routine time and again for every foreign key in your database I stress this label, this conversion of representations is totally unnecessary because in order to get rid of this labor, you only have to change the representation and nothing more. Every pair of tables you ever join, then you have made joinable. The significant part of your labor is to make all joins precisely predictable. You have to ensure that every jo that all joins will result in a set of relations you have meant to store. So do you, do you need an operation which result you already know? No join will, create, will reveal any new information. And multi-table indexes will provide you the opportunity to store relations between relations instead of recalculating them repeatedly. But it takes a small step, a tiny taboo breach. Tables aren't relations, indexes are. Do you sense a taboo breach? Yes, you do. So I'm proposing, I'm proposing a brand new query language, which will represent all relations, including those between other relations, homogeneously and provide you the unique, the single representation for all relations. Let there be a tiny library. It is somewhat ugly library because 
every book can have only one author. I did it just for the sake of the example, because I'm not very creative about examples, but those from real life, from real life, they are too complex for one hour speech. So, let's assume in context of our example, an author is an immanent property of a book. To get the idea about um, data definition language, let us just describe what do we see on this picture. There are six, roughly six, relations. A relation author on the pair text time stamp where both, uh, both domains are aliased. So an author is a pair name birth date. A relation book is a triple of author, title and timestamp. And a relation book, uh, a relation genre is a unary relation. You can think of it as a, as a list of available genre names. And a relation book genre is a typical relation many to many. Note, excuse me. What features do we see in these four lines of code? Uh, first, from the first look, there is no, um, there is no separators which clutter in your code heavily. No meaningless commas and semicolons, but it's minor feature. The major feature is that domains, in the context of a domain, a relation is interchangeable with a basic type. You, you can just interchange relations and basic types in, in a context of a relation domain. That's the major feature of this DDL. Also note the relations department and available. The relation available, however, it is uh, limited by one to many. Uh, does not make uh, a department a domain of a book, which is pretty natural. I hope you all agree that a department at which a book is available in our library is not a property of a library, or is not a property of a book itself. So it is a separate relation, but if you practice if you practice tables, the department will sneak into the definition of the book like this. And I, I think you, you, you can recognize this pattern. Our department suddenly become a domain of a book. It become a property of a book itself. And it is so usual, uh, so, I don't know, so usual pattern that you cannot say what is wrong with it at first look. So it appears pretty normal. In fact, this pattern is accepted as a norm nowadays. So that while practicing tables, while programming, but while using the notion of table, we create a chain of misrepresentations of reality. Further complicated with uh, efficiency, uh, optimization issues. Well, enough of DDL. Let us select something. In order to select all books, what information do I have to provide to the system? 
the relation name apparently so it, it is not a question I, I have to provide a relation name in order to select from this relation uh, or anything else do I need to provide any more information in order to select all books from my database I said all books. Ah, you mean projection. Uh, projection is a different operation. We are talking about selection right now. So, you all agree that this information is enough for selecting all books. Here we are, selection operation at your service. But, as you said, Ah, you, you didn't say it. <laughs> okay, uh, we will talk about projection a few slides later, but now we have to specify a subset of a relation. Uh, luckily, everything is already invented. Can you do book slash two and get half of the books? Thanks for question. I appreciate your sense of humor. <laughs> we have to specify a subset of, uh, of a relation. And we take unceremoniously a set, a set comprehension syntax from the set theory. Just, it is already invented. We only have to use it. Uh, this is a selection of all books entitled with capital A. And also a selection, do you see the last line? Also a selection of all the books entitled with the capital A and also issued uh, after the year 1940. But sometimes, and indeed quite often, it is very convenient to think about selection as narrowing relation domains down. And if I say, let's say, if I narrow one domain down to a single value, I can get a relation of lower dimension. But it takes positional reference to relation domains. Here's an example of positional reference where we narrow down the domain name to the one value and we left another domain unbounded. Dot stands for unbounded domain. Well, it the second example is more complex. It gives us all books of the given author who mentioned subqueries. Yes, but you cannot say it is a subquery. It is just a selection from book, and in this selection we simply specify one domain author. It's pretty natural, and it it is self-similar. You 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 don't need to stack. You you don't need to pile a select on, on another select, etc. No. And we don't need to specify joins, yes? There is no join. Just imagine it, friends. No more joins. You simply write what you want to see without this cluttering. But on the other hand, we can introduce an operation much more powerful than a join. A selection uh, an operation of looking a relation up for 
duples somehow related to a subset of another relation. In this example, we select all genres of the given author. And we do not have to specify how to connect this relation with this relation. Because we have already specified the connection between these relations in our data definition. Finding a path in a graph, it is not a rocket science. It is pretty algorithmical, pretty algorithmic job. So let the computer compute. Projection. Ah. Ten minutes. Five minutes. Ten. Ten. It is not even a, a half of a lecture. <laughs> okay. Projections. You 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 wanted. I, I I couldn't resist the stereotype to use dot to denote projections. Now here we select an author of all books entitled uh, with capital A. But we need a projection to more, uh, we need a projection to more, than to more than one domain. So I employ parentheses to create a list of domains. Here we select two domains from the relation book. That's the answer to your question about projections. But each domain is a relation itself. So we need a recursive projection. Here's the example of recursive projection. And before I introduce any data management, uh, any DML statement, We need to create rows. This is an example of row constructor. And this is an example of uh, Cartesian product. Uh, guys, uh, I employed parentheses again to denote Cartesian product. And the Cartesian product is completely indistinguishable from, uh, from a row constructor, from a tuple constructor. And it is very convenient indeed. Yes. A tuple constructor is simply a special case of a Cartesian product. Output of this example is three pairs. Also, it will be convenient to introduce a set constructor. And yet again, I have employed parentheses. <laughs> Here is a tuple, here is a, a set of two tuples, and here is a Cartesian product of two sets, which result in four tuples. Now we can add some new tuples to the existing relation. Here we simply create a tuple and add this tuple to the relation. Uh, pretty clear annotation. Uh, no cluttering, minimum keywords, pretty straightforward. For the sake of an example, we can duplicate the relation genre. We declare relation genre 2 and simply add all tuples of genre into the genre 2. A removal operation. Well, in order to remove a, a, a tuple from a relation, you have to specify the relation name and the exact tuple which does not belong to this relation anymore. 
pretty simple. And the, uh, I think it will be convenient to be to have an option to omit Jean, uh, to omit a relation name from this uh, statement if the relation is clearly deductible from the expression. But I'm not sure that. Well, uh, let, uh, let's remove let's remove something from a relation with regard with respect to another relation. For example, we remove author of all books entitled with capital A. No more ugly delete from from. It is much simpler than delete from from, isn't it? But this valid statement will result in an error because author is a domain of a book. So it is required by other tuples from book. And we, we will always have adjacent relations. So we, we have a strategy to deal with this problem. And this is why I introduced, uh, there are two, two possible strategies. We either throw an error and roll back the removal, or remove those tuples which require the removed one. And both strategies are reasonable, and in some cases, each of them can be required. So I introduced remove cascade, which performs the latter strategy, while remove stands for, for the former strategy. Remove performs more cautious removal, while remove cascade is remove cascade, you know. Uh, let's remove all boring books from our example. Remove cascade, book, and we select which particular books we want to remove from another relation. We select domain book from the relation book genre, which also refers to the genre bore. So that we, uh, I show in yellow, those rela uh, affected relations are shown in yellow. First, it will delete. Mm, first, what I'm talking about? It just delete all given books and delete all adjacent tuples in adjacent relations. So, no more boring books in our example. Almost the same result we can get by removing author Tolstoy. <laughs> Updates. Update statement is the most uh, um, controversial matter. From the perspective of pure relational system, it is even doubtful whether update statement has a right of existence. Because you, do you really need to update to create a Dawkins' tuple from a Shakespeare's tuple. If you really want to do such an update, I strongly recommend you add remove procedure, but I'm, I'm keeping in mind that there are, uh, there are strong apology for update statement. It's uh, input errors. We always make in data input errors, so I introduce update statement. This example capitalizes all author names and I use destructive assignment in this case. <laughs> well, enough, enough DML, we don't have time. Let's talk about assignments a little bit. SQL badly lacks of assignments. Uh, if we want to, to add 
book Iliad and we don't have author Homer in our library, it will not work, it will throw an error initially. So we have to add author before we add book of this author and then commit. Uh, obviously, we can optimize the selection of newly created uh, tuple. So we employ assignment. We employ assignment. We just use uh, some sort of a pointer, leftover uh, insert operation and use it in the following operation. No, no, no magic, but it also improves the outfit of the code, it improves the notation. And we do not care what sort of a representative uh, a variable is. It can be a primary surrogate key or a pointer or a copy of a tuple. It is up to optimizer. No, uh, I don't have time to talk about laziness. It's, it's very important that we actually can implement laziness if we implement transactions. I suppose we do uh, just a quick uh, round of questions until the next speaker is going to kill you because he it's his um, it's his turn. <laughs> okay, just a question. Uh, a a one-hour presentation. It, it, it is only a sketch of a language. It cannot answer all your questions, but it, it can raise its questions, luckily. And major paradigm questions, such as split context, enumerated types versus relations, legitimacy of set of sets, delimiters versus parentheses, constraints versus wrappers, combining queries with functions, and do we require purity? Do we remember that a, a relation is always a function of its primary key? Laziness and transactions and deferred execution, very important question. Do we need a procedural language if we can just store transactions? And do we need explicit output operation? This is my favorite question. An explicit output operation. So I wish we launch a full-scale debate on these topics so, you're welcome. Any questions? Is there a It's it's a proposal yet. But a working prototype or so that you. Uh, do you want me to make it uh, on my knees with my own hands in few ye in few months? Yes, I see the implementation of this idea uh, as a fork of PostgreSQL and in the first place we have to intro introduce multi-table indexes and then we have to introduce the brand new query language. Can't you sort of fake multi-table indexes with uh, we can fake everything. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I explained you the problem of the search dimension. <laughs> so it, the problem of the search dimension will remain if you fake uh, multi-table indexes with materialized views at first glance. It, 